Today's daf we're going to be learning is Nidarim Daf Lama Gimel. Um, I want to go back. Ruth, thank you for raising the issue. I looked into what you wrote me. So in the story in Kohelet that we quoted yesterday about the um, the Irk Tana, there was a small city, and then there, were, there was king who came around, built all these rights, besieged the city. And then it was basically, they said it was an, as, um, a, a metaphor or analogy for the Yetzir Hara, the evil inclination basically came with all of its power. And then it said, right, and then people sinned. That was the Mitzodim Gedolim, the big towers. Umatzam ba'ish miskem v'chacham, and they, they found this one man. There was the Yetzir Hatov, it was the symbol of the, the good inclination. Umilat to ta'ir b'chochmato. Now the word milat means a few different things. The word milat can mean to escape, which is how I translated it. But when I looked up all the commentaries on the Pasuk, and thanks to Ruth's comment, um, milat to ta'ir, actually in this context, uses a different definition of milat, which is not escaped, but he saved the city. And I saw different interpretations. Either he actually saved the city, which was, you know, the evil inclination. Now you think of those, those um, you know, the good guy comes and catches, you know, and... and undoes all the bad work of the bad guy. Um, so Milato et Yerbo which was Chuvao Masim Tovim, basically saved the city, or, then it's a little hard to explain it that way, because on the next line is, but nobody remembered that Ish Miskain, and then basically the evil inclination took over, and then nobody remembered him anymore because he kind of got taken over by the evil inclination, which could mean he saved the city, but then later nobody remembered him anymore because he was good for a short period, but then the Yetzir Harat took over. But another interpretation I saw was, he tried to save the city. In other words, he was he could have saved the city. He had the potential to save the city. But then the Yesara got the better of him, and as a result, he didn't save the city. So thank you for pointing that out, um, the translation. Anyway, that was a correction of that story. And again, it was brought in the context of these other stories about the Yetzir Hara and, the, and how you know much it's in the body and how one can try to overcome it. And you know, it was a whole discussion about which Evarim were the important Evarim to be in control of. Tough. With that, we're going to move on and start again from the beginning of our chapter to get us back into the topic, um, beginning of chapter 4. There's two types of, there's many different ways, but let's say there's two main ways. These are definitely, we've been discussing them in the Masechet a lot. I will not benefit from you, or I will not eat from you, right? I will not benefit food-wise from you. So the main difference between them is really only drisat regel and kelim she'en osim ba'em ochal nefesh. Number one, I won't be able to walk through your house if I said I won't benefit from you. However, I can do that if I said I won't have anything to do with you food-related. Um, but and, and if I want to use your utensils, I can use them only if they're not utensils that are meant for food purposes. And therefore, the Mishnah basically continues and explains, and, and later we'll see in the Gemara maybe, was there a need really to explain all this? But anyway, the mission explains, if you can't eat from someone else, you, you're mudar hana'ah from them relating to food, then lo yeshilenu, he can't loan you, or she can't loan you, nafa, kvara, rechaim v'tanur, any kind of household utensils that have to do with food, that are used in the food preparation. But, avamashilo chaluk v'taba v'talitu nizamit. But they can loan you clothing, jewelry, anything like that. To which the Gemara pointed out, Mantana, who's the Tana of this Mishnah, Amarav Adabar Ava, Rabbi Eliezer, he did Tanya, Rabbi Eliezer, Omer, Afilu, Vitor, Asur, Bermudar, Hana'a. First thing the Gemara focuses in on this is Drisat HaRegel. Drisat HaRegel is letting someone walk through your house. Normally, that is not something that you charge for, right? You either do or you don't, but it's not really, it doesn't have a financial value to it. So it says, that's Rabbi Eliezer's opinion, who basically says, you still can't benefit even if it doesn't have a monetary value on it because that's still benefit, which is an interesting concept, is benefit always financial, and he basically holds it's not. Obviously, not everybody agrees with him, because they're basically saying our Mishnah holds by his opinion. And later, we'll see another line where they say our Mishnah clearly holds by Rabbi Yes. Now, the Gemara is going to talk about this mudar hana'a mechavero, le'yashilenu, I'm sorry, mudar ma'acha mechavero, if you won't be able to eat from him right now. Look at, look at the language. The language says, you mudar ma'acha, which means you are forbidden, by a vow, to not have food of this person's. Ma'achal is food. So the Gemara says, if it's if you said in the language that you can't have food from this person, now we're starting at the top of our daf, lami gimel amat alif, vahan min ma'achal nadal. Sounds like it's only from food. You specifically said food, not 
food preparation. You said food. So why shouldn't that only be food? Why should I not be allowed to borrow your, your sifter or something like that, your oven? So the first answer is, I'm a Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, Rashbal, Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, it's an uh, abbreviation. Be'omer hana'at ma'achacha alai. It would only be, if you use this language of, the benefit of food will, right, the benefit of your food will not be upon me, which already is a more general hana'a from food, which already goes to utensils, pots, pans, anything, anything like that. To which the Gemara says, if you use this language of hana'ama chacha alai, then you could go even farther. And you can say, if it's any benefit from some kind of food item that you would eat, well, then you would come to this weird conclusion, which is, Ema From there, you would say, well, if you chew on kernels of, of wheat, which they would do, and then use the chewed up mixture as a, a salve for putting it on a, on a wound, sounds like you wouldn't be able to do that. But didn't our mission seem to indicate it was just food-related items? Now, this is something you say, benefit from something I ate could be also benefit from something I chewed, which means you wouldn't be allowed to get uh, help for your wound. Now, that really wouldn't be included in food, even though we did put in it, he or she put it in their mouth, chewed it, but still. Don't think about it, right? It's a little bit disgusting sounding that they would use this, but that was one of the methods they would use to, to heal wounds. So Amarava, so Rava fixes Rish Lakish's words and says, well, I would change it a little bit. And that sounds more like the proper language. Even the first language Rish Lakish changed it to didn't exactly sound like food preparation. This really sounds like food preparation. Hana'a, benefit that will bring toward food, will be forbidden to me, okay? I won't benefit from anything that will bring me toward eating. And then it will exclude the case of the medicinal purposes, and it will include the food-related, right? Any kind of food prep. To which Rav Papa says, okay, well then let's include a bunch of other things. I'm Rav Papa, sak la vi perot. Take a bag to the store to get vegetables, so I won't be able to borrow your, your bag, because that allows me to buy stuff. V'chamor la vi ala perot. What about borrowing your donkey to go carry my fruits home from the shuk? Afilu tzana ba'alme, any sort of utensil that could hold the food in it would be a problem. Because all those things help you, right? So we went from foods to food prep, like, uh, you know, the, the millstone that's grinding the grains and that's actually really making the food, the oven where you're cooking the food, to going even one step farther to items that you use when you're shopping or something like that, or storing your food. Now come the interesting questions of Rav How far do we take that? By Rav Papa, he asked the following question. Sus lir kovalav. What if I'm going to a party and I'm going to eat at the party and I want to borrow your horse, now you're forbidden to me, food related, can I borrow your horse to go to this place where I want to eat? Is that allowed? Or tabat lera otba. This is even more interesting. Let's say I want to go to a place where there's some party going on and I know if I look nice and dressed up, the, the owner will offer me some food, you know, or I'm going to some sort of somewhere where if I look better and I have nice jewelry, it'll increase my chances of getting food. So if I borrow your ring, is that considered bringing me food? Mif mahu. So what's the case? Now he asks another one. Mif sakumeza ba'are. What if I want to pass through your yard to get to a place where, or your field, to get to a place, let's say it's a shortcut, to get quicker to a place where there's food for me to eat? Is that allowed? Right? So how far do we take this? The Gemara says, ah, oh, we can find an answer in our Mishnah. Tashma, let's learn from here. Now, we kind of said that line was a little bit unnecessary because once you had the first line, it was clear utensils that have to do with cooking, like the oven and the sifter, etc. Those obviously are forbidden. Things that don't have to do with it, like a talit and a and a you know your cloak and your and your jewelry. Of course, that's permitted. So the mission didn't really need to tell us that. Therefore, the Gemara says, "Hey Chidami, what's the case?" Ah, oh, maybe the talit and nizamim and all those things mentioned in the second part were there to tell you, even if you need them to go somewhere, and it'll increase your chances of getting food there because you look nice and respectful, respectable. Maybe that's what the Mishnah was saying. But you can loan those items 
even if they might actually help you get food because they're not directly related to food preparation. So then, as the Mishnah Gemara says, it's necessary to say in our Mishnah. So they say, therefore, what it's telling you is, even Leira Ogbaim, it's not an issue. And it says, because you can, it says you can borrow them. So again, if what they were not saying, which is obvious, is there would be no point to tell you, it, it would be totally obvious, as I said, when we read the Mishnah. Of course, it's not related to food, to wear clothes, right? You can eat without those clothes on. So therefore, it, it can't be just telling you simply that. It's just too obvious. To which the Gemara says, not necessarily. Well, you don't have to assume that the Mishnah was saying, you're allowed to borrow the ring to look nice so you can get yourself food. No, it's not necessarily saying that. In which case, we end up without any answer to Rav Papa. And why not? We can understand the Mishnah simply as we understood it originally, which is, it's just telling you, don't bar- you I'm sorry, you can borrow rings and, and talid and all those things. But The Mishnah just wanted to tell you what are items that are food related, what are items that aren't food related. Again, we probably could have figured that out without the Mishnah telling us. But sometimes the Mishnah tells you things that are somewhat obvious. You just want to bring examples. And therefore, you don't have an answer. We don't have an answer to our Papa's question because it's not clear from our Mishnah. Moving on to the next Mishnah, which is really part connected to this Mishnah. And in fact, they're going to connect it to the previous one in a minute. It's a continuation. If it's an item that is not food related. So let's say I said I won't benefit from food, right? Any kind of food prep, whatever, however my language included all of that we said before. And in fact, you loan me something that has nothing to do with food. Okay, you lent you lend it to me. No money, you, no money trans. Right, you don't you didn't rent it to me. You loaned it to me. Well, makom shemaskirin kayotze bahen asul. Let's say you lend me your donkey, not to go buy food. Okay, you lend me your donkey, and uh, to carry I don't know some work items on them. Okay, nothing having to do anything with food. If normally we live in a place where donkeys get rented and nobody gives people donkeys for free in general, and you gave me your donkey for free, guess what? That benefits me relating to food. Why is that? Because you've saved me money and with that money, I can now go buy food. So another kind of indirect thing that's learned, which is if I now have money and I was thinking about it, it's probably food because one of the biggest items that people buy with their money is food. Right? I don't know if it would be something else that would be, you know, sometimes people spend it. But one of the main things, if you have extra money, you're going to spend it probably on food. Or one of the things that's likely you're going to spend it on is food. And therefore, if you save me money in some other way, and that can then go to food, even if I, even if I don't put it toward food, but still, since it could theoretically go toward food, that would be forbidden for me to benefit as well. So this is a... a a big expansion of the first mission. The first mission, we thought it was just food. All of a sudden, if it's an item that's normally rented and you lent it to me for no money, I just borrowed it, that will be a problem if I've saved, you've saved me money. Because that money could go to food. To which the Gemara says, wait, if this Mishnah says, Makom Shemaskirim, right, a place where it's rented, and it's not food related, it's going to be forbidden, then when it is food related, it must be forbidden even if it's not generally rented. And this is going to take us back to where we started this morning, which is Michlal de Resha Afapisha So from here it sounds like when it talked in the first Mishnah, the, the one from the beginning of the chapter, that you can't loan me utensils like the Kvaran Afao, the sifting, the, the sifter, the sieve, the millstone, the oven, is even if we live in a place where women just loan them out for free, you still can't give it to me. Which shows us what? Back to square one. Mantana, who's the Tanu, says this. I'm Rabbi Debrava, Rabbi Eliezer. He again, Rabbi Debrava says, another proof that our mission is Rabbi Eliezer. First, we have the Drisat Regal proof, because that's not anything that has a monetary, you know, like a tag on it that costs something. Likewise, if loaning your sifter has no monetary value to it, and yet I'm not allowed to do it, it shows that it's Rabbi Eliezer's opinion, who views that benefit isn't only weighed in money. New Mishnah. This you might remember from the end of Masechik Tubot. If you learn Masechik Tubot, 
near the very end. If you remember, we said, oh, we're getting into Nadarim already. They start mentioning things from Masechet Nadarim. And now we're going to have kind of the flip direction of the way there we had the Mishnah. We connected it to the Mishnah in Nadarim. Here we have our Mishnah in Nadarim, and we're going to connect it to the Mishnah in Ketubah. Hamudal Chana Ami Chavero. If you are forbidden to benefit from your friend, Shokelo et Shiklo, that friend can give your half shekel to the temple treasury. Uporea et Chovo, they can pay back your loan. Okay, these are not considered benefit. We're going to have to figure out why is that. Umachzir lo et avedato, and you can return, that you can return to me a lost item. Okay, that's going to be a little simpler than the other one, so I'll explain that one already, because you're basically returning something that's mine already. That's not considered that you've benefited from me, because you didn't give me something that wasn't mine. You gave me just something that was mine. It's true, I had lost it, but you gave it back to me. There's just one issue, though. If you generally, people who find lost items get paid, how do they get paid for that? Well, let's say you spent an hour between picking it up off the floor, off the ground, bringing it into your house, maybe you had to clean it off, deal with it somehow, then you had to find me, you brought it to me, let's say that took you an hour of time, it was an hour you weren't working, it's called schar batala, I would have to pay you the amount of time that you spent that you weren't doing your job. So if it's a place where people generally pay someone who returned their lost item, then tipol hana'ala hektesh, and now you have to add one more thing, and you didn't charge me, okay, so it's a place where normally we charge, this time, you didn't charge me. You decided you weren't going to charge me. Then I benefited because I didn't spend money that I would have normally had to spend. So what do we have to do with that money if you're not willing to take the money from me? Take that money. We take it out of my hands so that I don't actually have any benefit. What do we do with that money? We give it to the temple. Okay, we benefit the temple. Now the Gemara goes back to the first two cases. You can take my machetzida shekel. You can give it for me. And you can return my loan. Now, this is very strange because theoretically you're saving me money. So I now don't have to pay when they come to knocking on my door for the machatzida shekel. I could say someone already paid for me. I don't have to pay. I don't have to pay back the loan when the, when the creditor comes and says pay up. I don't have to. So that's a clear benefit. Well, Alma, from here you can infer, it's basically like saving someone from a lion that's about to attack them. And that's permitted. Okay, what does that mean? Saving someone from a lion? What basically is we're preventing you from having a loss. You, by you paying my shekel, that means that when they come to get my shekel, I don't have to pay it. That basically is preventing me from a loss. But you're not actually giving me money in my pocket. Okay, that's just preventing a loss. So that seems to be permitted. Montana, who's the Tana who holds this way? And now we're going to have a machloket. Is it only Hanan or is it the Bnei Koanim Gedolim? We disagree with Hanan, and we'll talk about that in one minute. Before we get there, I just want to point out, I want to read in the Ron for a minute. He basically says, the, the shekel, you have to explain something else, which is the machatzira shekel. And we explain this at the end of, uh, of uh, Ketubo when we learned this. He says, Three lines from the bottom of the Ron. He says, if, let's say I never paid it. Okay, so I would have to deal with the collector. He would come knocking on my door and saying, you owe the money. And that I would have to deal with. So you've saved me from that loss. But I would still be involved in the Korbanot Sibor. It would be part of, anyway, because even people whose money gets lost on the way to the temple, or even people who didn't pay yet, are still included. What's all this money? This money's going to buy the public offerings that are given in the temple, like the Korban Tamid. It's given every day, twice a day. So those that goes to cover that. I'm covered anyway, even if I don't give them a chatzida shekel. So because of that, you're not benefiting me because I'm I'm part of it in any case. If you remember, the Gemara there also suggested something else, which is it's a mitzvah, and mitzvot are not benefit. It's not like you benefited me for me because there is no benefit for mitzvot. That's not called a hana'a when I get a mitzvah. It's not it's not that I benefited. That's different. Mitzvot are in a different category. They're not there for my benefit. So, which is a whole interesting thing in and of itself, which comes up in many sugi. But here, the Ron doesn't quote that for some reason, but he quotes the part about, you're just not, you're part of the Korbanot Sibor in any case. Okay, so now the question is, who does this go by? We're going to have two opinions. Does it go only by Hanan, or does it also go by the Bnei Kohen Dolim? So, and we'll get to Hanan and the Bnei Kohen Dolim in a second, if you don't remember them from Ketubot, or you didn't learn Ketubot. So, Mantana, Amarav Hoshaya, Zot Tivrei Hanani, this is Hanan, 
And Rava says, Afilu tema de Rehakol. I'm going to skip Rava right now. I want to just go right to line number three on Da Amubet. We just turned to Amubet. And first read the Mishnah because it's impossible to understand this without knowing what Hanan and Kohanim would him say. So you kind of wish the Gemara had said it before. I'm going to take the liberty to skip, go, and then go back. Tanan. Okay, my Hanan. So the Gemara wants to say, who is Hanan? They assume, you know, you might not have seen the end of Masechek Tubot. Did Tanan, or if you did, you might not remember it. Did Tanan, it says in the Mishnah, Misha halach le Medinat Hayam. This is on Daf Kuf Zayin Amubet in, in Tubot. Someone goes abroad, husband, marriage. Woman, he goes abroad. What happens? He doesn't leave her food. Amad Achad. Random guy comes, maybe his friend, we don't know. Uprinesit Ishto, he saw this woman. She had no food. He said, I'll support her while the husband's gone. Husband comes back on the scene. Can the person say, hey, look, you were supposed to pay Mizona for your wife. You didn't pay them. I'm going to, you know, I need, please give me the money for it. All the money I spent. So Hanama, <coughs> Hanan says, Ibed at Mauta. Excuse me. Hanan says, you lost your money. <laughs> Who asked you? The husband didn't say, please support my wife. You lost your money. Why'd you lose your money? Because this is what we said. And this is why Rav Hashaya says, this is Hanan, or Mishnah, because it's Mavriach Ari. What you basically did is, you prevented that man from having to pay money for his wife. So it's not like you gave him something in hand. You prevented a loss. And since nobody asked you to do it, he made it Mautav. Now, by the way, you would have to then say, which we didn't talk about, but actually the commentaries say, it must be in these cases where you paid the loan, or you paid the machatzira shekel, for me, I didn't ask you to do it. If I asked you to do it, it would be a different story. Then you're benefiting me. But you did it without my asking. And then it would be very similar to this case. So Hanan says you lost your money. <laughs> disagreed with him entirely and said, what do you mean? If you decided to support me, let's say my husband went away, you decided to support me. Well, when my husband shows up on the scene, Take an oath, because nobody really knows what you spend. Take an oath saying exactly how much money you spend. And you get it back from the husband. The Mishnah continues. I'll just finish up the Mishnah, and then we'll go back. Amar Rabbi Dose ben Harkinis kedivrehen. Rabbi Dose ben Harkinis held like b'nei koni gudolim. Amar Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, yafe amar Hanan. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai sided with Hanan and said, Hiniach motav al keren atzvi. By you deciding to just on your own initiative, nobody asked you to go support this guy's wife, that was like putting your money on the on the horns of a deer. Deer runs very fast. If you put your money on the horns of a deer in another second, the deer will probably run away and you will not be able to catch up to that deer. And basically it was your fault for, you know, it, you should have known that you were never going to get that money back. So let's go back to our case. So comes Rav Hoshai and he says, you can see from our Mishnah that clearly you pay back my loan for me. I didn't ask you to do it. You paid my machatzida shekel for me. I didn't ask you to do it. You did it. You prevented me from a loss, just like the husband who was abroad. And Hanan says, he doesn't have to pay me back. Likewise, in this case, that's not considered benefit. Okay? It's the same idea. Rava Amal, afilu tema divrayako. Rava says, I can explain our Mishnah, even according to B'nai Kani Gdolim. Okay, so B'nai Kani Gdolim said in the case of the husband, he had to pay the money back. But here it would be different. Why? It must be, it was a loan that was not meant to be collected. Now, that's a strange thing. It sounds like an oxymoron, a loan that was not meant to be collected. So there's two ways to understand this. Either, I mean, the main way to understand it is it didn't have a date, an end date. Now, if you don't have an end date for a loan, you know that you could basically push it off indefinitely. And therefore, if it was that kind of loan, then, so first of all, let's go back to the Machatzida Shekel. Remember we said the Machatzida Shekel, theoretically, I don't even, I need to pay it and maybe they could come bothering knocking on my door. But the fact is, I'll be included even if they didn't pay it. So it's not like I really have to pay it. I kind of do, but I could get away without not paying it. And the loan, if you told me that I don't, let's say, well, actually, you're the one who I'm not allowed to benefit from, but I had a loan with someone else and they never gave me an end date, and you paid it back for me, I could say that didn't benefit from me because I didn't have to pay it back today anyway. I could have kept pushing it off and pushing it off. You haven't really helped me because it's not like that loan was 
stressing me out at all in any way because I had no ending to it. Now, the other thing to remember is that sometimes people give loans and they don't really ever intend to take it back, right? Now, right on the one hand, you say, what do you mean? It was a loan. Of course, you want, the person wanted the money back. Not necessarily. Sometimes people loan you money because it's a form of charity. And maybe they really, you know, maybe they don't need the money and they decide I clearly need the money more than them and they'll just let it go. So that's why you're not, even according to the B'nai Kuanim Jolim, when it comes to the money that you actually put up for this husband who actually was responsible and had to pay the money for his wife, that you have, the husband has to pay back. But this is a different case. And therefore, since I didn't even necessarily have to pay it, Therefore, you actually didn't really benefit me. So that's Ravi. He can explain our Mishnah according to both opinions. Now we're going to do one of those, why didn't he like hold like the other one? So now we already read the Mishnah, so we're going to skip, okay? And as we, we, again, we jumped forward to read the Mishnah so that we understood the line before. We went back to the top of Amu Bet and read the two opinions. Then we're going to go back now to after the quote of the Mishnah, Mamash, about the middle of the page, um, Rava lo amar ke Rav Hoshaya. Why didn't Rava hold like Rav Hoshaya? Rav Hoshaya said it was only Hanan's opinion. This is obvious. It's always better if you can read the Mishnah in being everyone's opinion. Okay, it always works better when you can say the Mishnah isn't just one one person's opinion, but it's everybody. Rav Hoshaya lo amar ke Rava. This one's a little bit more complicated. Rav Hoshaya didn't hold like Rava. Why? Let's go back to what Rava said. Rava basically said there's two types of loans. There's a loan with a date, and there's a loan without any date. The loan with a date, if you do it for me, then that's clearly, you pay it back for me, then I've clearly benefited from you. The loan without any end date, I haven't benefited from you. Now, even if the B'nai Kwanim Dolim agree in theory that you haven't caused me any benefit because there's no end date, they would still say, and this is why Rav Hoshaya doesn't think the B'nai Kohanim Dolim would agree here, they would still say, well, we're not going to allow me to benefit from you when we have this kind of loan, because then we might think that I could benefit from you if you pay back when we have a different kind of loan. Okay? Basically, remember, there's two kinds of loans, one with an end date, one without an end date. The one without it, with an end date, I, that's benefit. The one without an end date is not benefit. But if we allow me the one where I'm not benefiting really, People might think that I'll be allowed to benefit from you paying back my other loan types of loan as loans as well, or maybe someone else who has the same issue, and therefore they think, or Rav Hoshaya thinks, and didn't hold like Rava because he thinks that the Bnei Kohanim Jolim would have made this gzera and would have said we can't start distinguishing between loan with an end date, loan without an end date. It'll just cause confusion, and that's why he didn't go with Rava's interpretation. Okay, last part for today. So that was a pretty simple case, right? Where we assumed when we read the Mishnah, or at least you assume this because I explained it that way, which is I can't benefit from you and you're returning me my lost item. You can return it to me because you're just giving me something that was my own. But there's a machloka between Rabbi Ami and Rabbi Asi about what exactly is the case in the Mishnah. Pliye bar Rabbi Ami for Rabbi Asi. Chan amar, lo shanu ela b'shenichze machzir asurim abal aveda. Basically, he's going to say it's only that case, okay? So if the case is that I can't benefit from you and I'm the one who lost the lost item and you want to return it to me, that's the only case in the mission. That's how we explain the mission. Why? Because, so number one, they explain, when you return it to me, you're just returning me something that was already my own. And that's why I'm allowed. But if it's the reverse, what if, what if I, I'm the one who lost the item, you want to return it to me, you can't benefit from me. Let's say it's the flip case. Not that I can't benefit from you, which is the case we thought. You can't benefit from me. Now you're thinking, what on earth benefit are you getting from me? Well, listen right now. If your property is forbidden to me, I'm sorry, if my property is forbidden to you, you can't benefit from me at all, then lo kamahadole, you can't give me back the lost item. Why is that? De kamahani le pruta de Rav Yosef. Salacha, we actually learned about this in, um, in Mesechet Sukkah. 
If you remember, ha'osek min mitzvah patra min mitzvah. When you're busy dealing with one mitzvah, you're exempt from another mitzvah. And one of the examples brought there, one of the main examples is you're dealing with someone's lost item. Okay, one of the things you have to do, for example, is if you, t- if you have a rug of someone's, you have to shake it out every 30 days so it doesn't get moldy. While you're shaking out that rug, okay, or while you're busy returning it to me, finding me, giving it to me, if somebody knocks on your door and asks for charity or someone stops you on the street and asks for charity, normally you have to give them. But since you're doing a mitzvah, you're exempt from another mitzvah. So since you're doing, you're dealing with that aveda, that's the pruta de Rav Yosef. Pruta de Rav Yosef is that you don't have to give this pruta to a poor person, as Rav Yosef said. You're patra osik ben a mitzvah, patra ben a mitzvah. So actually, I've caused you benefit because you now saved money in not having to give charity to that poor person. So that's the first opinion. We don't know which one said it, Rabbi Ami or Rabbi Asi, but one of them said, if the case was flipped, that would be forbidden. You wouldn't be allowed to return the last item because you're actually benefiting from me. Right? Counterintuitive to what we would have thought. Comes the other opinion, though, and says, no, no, no. Chanamal, vichanamal, and the other one said, even if you were not allowed to benefit from me, mehadarle, still you would return it. Umishim pruta de Rav Yosef lo shachiach. How many times does it happen that while you're returning the lost item, right at that moment, the poor person comes, right? First of all, how long does it even take you to deal with my lost item? And the fact that the poor person is going to come at that moment, that's so not a common occurrence. And therefore, of course, you can return it to me and that's not considered benefit to you. Okay, so while I see you're asking Becky about, isn't benefit of a mitzvah not a benefit? This is benefit, financial benefit, because you, you're saving money in not having to give to a poor person. So that's financial benefit. That's not mitzvah benefit. It's financial. So again, there's this machloket about whether the reverse case, if you couldn't benefit from me and you were trying to return me the lost item, would that consider that I was benefiting you because you're now exempt from giving charity? Or not, right? It, it wouldn't benefit you because you're exempt from some other mitzvah. It's just charity because it means you now don't have to give that money to the poor person. Or is that such a ra- rare instance that that would happen that that clearly is not what's included here at all? And even if it sounds like, according to that opinion, even if theoretically it would have happened, still we're not going to say that you can't return it because that's just part of, you know, in general, the general case would be that you could and therefore you could return it. Okay, that will finish here for today, and we'll continue more on this uh, tomorrow stuff. Shavuot Tov, everybody.